welcome to today's session on uh, architectures and standards for ethical data sharing. I really want to welcome everyone for, for joining today's virtual conversation. Uh, and I'm really excited about uh, my two fellow panelists that have joined today. Uh, they're Lynn Neese, who is the Chief Technologist for Hewlett Packard Enterprises IoT Activities. There, he develops strategy and drives innovation for key Hewlett Packard stakeholders. He also established HP's membership in the Industrial Internet Consortium and has led multiple activities in working groups and test beds for the consortium. Uh, I'd also like to introduce you to Deborah Stacy, uh, who joins us as Associate Professor of Computer Science at the University of Guelph, is the principal investigator of the Guelph Ontology team. Uh, which investigates the use and analysis of knowledge engineering and machine learning. She's also the co-lead of the informatics team for the global burden of animal diseases, uh, GBADS, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation supported project, looking at improving evidence-based decision-making around livestock worldwide. And my name is Rick and Gandhi. I'm the chief executive officer and co-founder of Digital Green, an organization that uses technology to improve the efficiency of agricultural extension systems and improve the access to markets of smallholder farmers across South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So on today's uh, discussion, we're going to really focus on the reasons and implications of restricting or masking different types of data. We all recognize the opportunities of sharing data amongst our various organizations to drive complementarity across our respective efforts and to drive impact amongst the various types of agricultural and food stakeholders that we engage with. But of course, it's not just a binary, do I share data or do I not share data? There's questions related to what data do I share uh, and who do I share it with and for what purpose and how do I ensure that it's done for the right reasons and in the right way that I intended? And so I think we've got a great uh, set of panelists to uh, lead us in this conversation. And I encourage all of you who are joining us today to participate as well. Please feel free to ask your own questions or share your own thoughts or ideas in the chat bot as this conversation takes place. And we'll be sure to triage them uh, during uh, the Q&A uh, that follows. In terms of the conversation uh, of our panel, uh, I've asked each of uh, my fellow panelists to present their work, uh, to introduce you to it. Uh, and then each of us will then have a conversation around uh, what was presented uh, so that we can get an interactive uh, d dialogue going. So with that, may I like to invite Deborah to first share her work with us today. Hello, everyone. Let me introduce myself. I'm Deborah Stacy. I'm at the University of Guelph in computer science, but I'm also here to talk about the work I'm doing uh, with a team of people, the GBADS informatics team. Uh, I'm the co-lead with Teresa Bernardo from uh, our uh, veterinary school. She's an epidemiologist. and. We're working uh, with a lot of different people on the global burden of animal diseases. This is a project that's funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, where our start is uh, we've just started right now. Um, full, full start will be in January 2021. And the goal is to improve decision making for animal health by integrating data from a variety of sources and sharing tools for analysis. And so we want to contribute to the sustainable development goals, of zero hunger, health and well-being, gender equality, responsible production and consumption, and economic growth. Uh, and this is our uh, main um, website, uh, giving, and it gives you an idea of what our overall goals are. But I'm part of the informatics team. So we have a, a, a modest goal, and that's to create a data utopia for GBAD so that we have a, a data portal and a knowledge engine that will provide uh, access to open and private data for many applications, our modeling, other people's modeling, and to facilitate ethical evidence-based decision making to support these sustainability goals. So to do that, we've got a bunch of different 
challenges that we have to look at about the difference between open and private data sharing. Uh, we want to act as trusted brokers of data. So we don't see ourselves as holding uh, that much data. We want to give access to uh, various data that's already out there. And we want to emphasize the need for machine to machine data sharing. So we don't want to always have to have a person in the loop. We want to have modelers and uh, various knowledge engines to be able to grab all of this data automatically. And so we're designing our data portals and knowledge engines to be secure and trusted and ethical by design. And to do that, we're going to follow various principles. The first one is one that's got a, a lot of following in the open uh, data sharing community. That's the FAIR guiding principles. Um, these are findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. So this relies on metadata, standard protocols, standard vocabularies, and looking at provenance for data. We'll also be looking at moving from FAIR to FAIR. So this is some work that we've been uh, doing on the project, and that's to look at security. If we're going to uh, incorporate private or non-open data, we have to have security designed in from the start. We have to be trusted brokers, and so we have to make sure that the platform that we uh, provide for GBADS modelers for uh, other people in the community is secure so that people can trust us. They can trust us with their data and that we have to have it trustable, trustworthy when we go to machine to machine uh, aspects of our work. So we've got some principles that we've set up to make this uh, secure by design. We also think it's very important to look at another set of principles for um, uh, data sharing, and that's to move beyond FAIR to CARE. And CARE is, um, a, uh, is a, a, a set of principles developed by the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. So this was looking at these principles to relate to the collection, storage, dissemination, curation, and use of Indigenous data, but we're looking at this being universal for all types of data. And that's why we'd like to go beyond FAIR to CARE so that we can work with all types of data because private data isn't just commercial data. It could be indigenous data. It could be data from populations at risk. So we have to be very respectful that we make sure that there's collective benefit, that these groups have the authority control uh, access to their data and the use of their data, that there's responsibility and that groups are brought together by this type of data sharing and that we maintain an ethical um, outlook for all of this. And one of the things that we've been doing lately is going over potential architecture designs. We're going to put this in the cloud. This is just an example using AWS, but we've got that green is really looking at the private part of the system, but it, there's also the public part in red so that we're embracing all types of data and that we're going to apply all of these principles, the FAIR and the CARE, to all types of data and to make sure that when we design our platform, we design a cloud architecture that's secure, scalable, and cost efficient. Cool. That was really uh, impressive work, uh, Deborah. really uh, ambitious uh, in terms of uh, the vision that you all have. Just one question from my side, and I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask Lynn to, to share any thoughts of his own. Uh, what do you see as uh, the, the primary driver for why folks will come on board onto this uh, system? And is there a canonical type of use case that you en envision that will drive uh, the sharing of data in, in this way? That's a very good question. We have had um, a lot of discussion with various um, potential stakeholders. Uh, we've talked to international agencies, uh, UN agencies, governmental agencies, um, they obviously are on board because they want to make sure that they can provide uh, data for people. That's part of their mandate. So we're just facilitating that. Uh, we all, we've also had um, conversations with commercial entities and we want to get to um, commercial agricultural um, uh, producers, uh, production systems, because they have the most timely data. They're collecting it right now. They have it in the most detail, far better than most international agencies or governmental agencies have. And we were actually um, 
pleasantly surprised by the fact that they actually are on board with the idea of being able to uh, selectively share, to get their data out there where it'll be the most meaningful and to work with a trusted broker to try to um, get as much value as they can from the data that they're collecting. So I think there's lots of um, goodwill in the community that they want they know that we have to address things like climate change um, uh, fragile uh, uh, ecosystems we have to look at uh, food security uh, in many regions of the world and the commercial entities involved with all the stakeholders involved with agriculture realize this they're just looking for a way so that they can safely privately share data for the benefit of obviously themselves i mean their commercial entities but they also have other things that they want to do involving climate and communities at risk yeah deborah how does gbads um differentiate uh the users and the suppliers what mechanisms are, are you building in to allow a user to, to carry what I'll call like a differential service, depending on who's asking for the data? And, with, and that's, it, that's one of the reasons why we've been looking at um, the cloud architectures that would help facilitate that. So um, we foresee that the open part of the system would be open for anybody. And we may not even need any kind of identification because we'd want to be encouraging uh, stakeholders to come and uh, get the uh, data and get the value added that we're planning on putting on top of it. The other thing though is that we want to um, create a way that we can actually do authentication and authorization and that we work with the stakeholders to provide um, information. And that's one of the reasons why we're looking at the care principles because we do want to set up in our system the data that we'd be storing would be around the provenance and the ethical principles and the sharing principles that we, so we're looking at the standards that are out there in the community and we're looking right now, designing that in and making that part of um, signing on to GBADS as a data supplier or as a partner so that upfront people will know how to provide their data, how to identify it and how to identify the potential users for their data. Thanks, Lynn, do you wanna share your work at HPE? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Rick. And, uh, what I thought I'd just briefly describe is some work that HP Enterprise is doing with uh, several other, uh, we'll, we'll call them IoT operations technology companies. And uh, the work is focused on how data sets themselves might be presented almost in a marketplace-like way. And, what we have come to realize in many of our customers, and keep in mind, this goes, this is agriculture, and the example I'll, I'll talk about here is agriculture related, but also in industrial IoT settings where people are trying to uh, to collect data off of assets of, of any type, whether it's oil refineries, healthcare data, uh, it could be manufacturing systems and processes. One of the problems we see with many of our customers is that people don't have a simple way of looking at data and letting software do the work that people are doing today. Um, and I'll give you some examples. And, and we'll start with this example you see on the screen here. Uh, you know, we have customers in the, in the academic space where they have researchers, for example, who are interested in you know, the economics of, of uh, agriculture and yields. And in this case, they want to take data sets from soil samples and weather stations and then look at uh, resulting crop yields and potentially mark up that data or address uh, different aspects of the, of the analysis and research. And in this case, uh, how does that person go about finding the data? And today, what they have to do is they have to go peruse many sources and white papers and try to infer on their own whether or not there's data that is interesting to them. The, the data sets are not published in any formal way. And we're kind of missing what you would think of as a world wide web for data sets. So in this case, how, did, how would this technology we're trying to standardize help this Dr. Jane Doe find the data sets that she's looking for and use them? And so if we drill down on what a sample data set might be, 
let's say it's a data set foo. It's a stored time series of soil data for you know the month of September based on a, on a particular GPS area. By having this sort of, think of this as, as, a, uh, as a catalog, much like what you would get on a, on a YouTube, a Netflix, an iTunes type catalog, but it's for data sets instead of for uh, entertainment media. And you would have the ability, depending on who you are as a user, to, to be uh, exposed to different aspects of these data sets for your perusal. You might sample it, you might buy it, you might rent it, very much like buying a book uh, would be. Uh, and in this case, the tool you're using would be a browser, and the browser would have uh, many capabilities of looking at this common set of metadata. Think of this as the, the highest level set of metadata that allows for the human consumption and perusal of data sets. And then to take this down to the next level, if you had software go to the trouble of not only telling you whether or not the data set has been filtered and outliers removed and what algorithm might have been used for that, but to be able to transfer that data to you or make it available to you via uh, an orchestration engine that might spawn a container in the system where the data is stored. For example, this were very high volume, uh, you know, rich, high bandwidth data. Point being is that the data plane need not interfere with the ability of human beings to offer, to publish, and to subscribe to these data sets and to do it in a way that's intuitive and to allow software do the work to do the work today that data scientists and, and data publishers unfortunately have to do. And on this data plane, there are many standards that we could leverage. You know, we've seen in, in uh, industrial and uh, IoT and uh, what they call Industry 4.0, Right, standardization of these API, uh, binary APIs like OPC UA that sit out in the control system space. Uh, many, many uh, sensors, for example, and gateways talk OPC UA. Uh, we've seen digital greens use of the International Data Spaces Association for secure data transfer clearly as a leverageable technology. And of course, uh, there are emer there's emerging work going on in the Git community, open space community for uh, the DVC activity, which is data version control. And once I have this data in my space as a researcher or as a, as a data scientist, then I can do version control and I could possibly even extend that version control back through this kind of like World Wide Web for data sets. So in a nutshell, we're trying to standardize this metadata layer at the very top of this picture. Yes, that was really interesting. Then I have one question that has concerned uh, GBADs in their work, and, and I see it that you've uh, looked at it, and maybe you have a solution, and that's integrating the data sets that individual researchers have. What do you see the major challenges around doing that? The, the key, and, and this is a very difficult problem, in the data world. Uh, what we see are many standards activities around semantics and ontologies. And the problem is that there is, I mean, there is no end to the, the number of factorial, we'll call it integrations, that one might need to do if they're trying to semantically come up with a common way of interpreting data. So our focus instead is to we'll call it take it on faith that if I have multiple researchers who are both producing and consuming data, that uh, you know, much like the OSI stack in networking, uh, the, the network between these the, the publish and consumption of data need not concern itself with the actual content, <laughs> but instead is there to, to create software mechanisms to get the data from the producer to the consumer in a way that they agree is, is, uh, is going to create a semantic alignment. And I think that for multiple researchers, the key here is if I publish data, so think about how we consume data off the web today. Uh, if you send me a video in QuickTime and someone else sends me a video in Windows, you know, movie format, I let software, you know, basically the metadata self-selects what software I use as a consumer to play back that, that file. I see the same concept coming about. If a standard emerges that everyone agrees on for this human consumption and publishing of data, software will emerge, think of them as drivers or plugins that allow people 
to not have to achieve complete semantic alignment, but to share data with one another. And perhaps, uh, Lynn, since you've worked in so many different sectors at HPE, what have you found in terms of driving uh, the sharing of data? Is it, and, and what generally starts first? Is it more like the raw data that folks kind of latch on to, or is it more of the process data that gets the ecosystem uh, to believe that there is value in having a standard in the first place? Yeah, so so what we run into is, uh, I can't tell you, and, and any, any one of our partners in this space knows this, they call it proof of concept health, <laughs> which is where we have customers who have, they understand the value of something like predictive maintenance or doubling crop yields, right? They understand the value of taking certain data and then using it. The algorithms and the approach to using that data is extremely well known. The justification for the plumbing work has always been the stumbling block. And so we, we're seeing a, a shift away from proving out the value of the data. It's well known what the value of the data is to proving out the investment required to use the data. And, and so um, in many cases, our customers are stuck not having the staff required. They, they embark on a project and they realize that to take five data sources, bring this, fuse this data together and create this conclusion, this inference might be something like a crop yield advice for upcoming weather conditions, for example, um, that, that the cost to bringing that data together continuously, not just now for an experiment, but for the next two years is, is too high in human labor costs. So that's part of the impetus for this. And the other part of this is many of our customers have suppliers of assets. And we know in agriculture, there's, there's suppliers of farm equipment who collect and, and keep all sorts of data about how that equipment is used. And many of our customers in the industrial space wish they had some of that data because it's very reflective and interesting for them for their own operations. And that's the workflow data. So there's a strong desire for our customers to be able to say, you're taking data from my operation. I own the knowledge of how my operation works. You own the knowledge of how your asset works. How do we come together so that we can both agree how to use this data? And we know for a fact that if the customers could make use of their own operational data more easily, it gets back to the human element and the cost of this labor, and this is high price labor when you talk about data scientists and people who can run these algorithms, Right. If they could make use of that data themselves, they might make it far more available to their suppliers. That makes sense. Uh, let me take a moment to present our work at Digital Green, and then we'll come back uh, as a plenary to have a conversation about what this all means. So at Digital Green, uh, we've, for the last 14 years, focused on improving the efficiency of agricultural extension systems in partnership with ministries of rural development and agriculture across various parts of South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And this work has reached more than 2 million farmers who watch these videos that are by and for farmers to share best practices that can increase uh, crop productivity and incomes. As we've done this with our partner organizations, we've also generated a ton of data about what practices these farmers are exposed to, what practices they ultimately apply in their field. And what we came to realize was that there was a real opportunity to see that this data that we were collecting, as well as a whole multitude of other organizations in these uh, countries in which we operate are collecting, uh, could be brought together to enable uh, greater complementarity across our respective interventions in a way that does so securely maintaining the various types of data protections that different organizations, including ourselves and our partners, want to have, uh, whether that is privacy or national security or the like, but drive this integration of data uh, to be able to, for instance, give farmers a more customized extension uh, message as per their uh, site specific location uh, and time of year as well as for the farmers themselves over time to gain greater control over their own data and share feedback about what's working and what's not to inform these various types of data models and machine learning algorithms that, that organizations are creating uh, to, inf uh, to 
identify what types of practices uh, farmers might find relevant or various types of connections to markets. And so that's where we have embarked on developing a system that we call FarmStack to create a decentralized exchange of data for the food and agricultural system. And of course, everyone wants to share data with each other because they see the value of both giving and taking data from one another. But of course, the biggest hindering blocks uh, for that prohibit that from ha happening as much as we'd like to see today is that there's reasons that organizations want to keep their data for themselves, whether it's a proprietary interest or a privacy interest. And so there's various issues of basic trust and security uh, that become really important. In addition uh, to what Lynn shared around folks don't even know what information is available uh, of what quality or what resolution. And so we've been building on an architecture uh, that is called International Data Spaces Association, FarmStack, to essentially move from the typical way in which data is shared, in which it is very binary. Either you give somebody access to data or you don't. And when you give somebody access to data, they can hold that data and can then copy it uh, to whatever extent they desire. And from the data provider's point of view, they essentially lose control uh, over their data. But with FarmStack, there's an opportunity to codify the various types of usage policies that organizations have between a data provider and a data consumer to, for instance, enforce rules like duration of usage or the ability to not be able to publish data online or to download it uh, or that they're only able to access aggregate forms of data or only use data for particular services uh, that the data provider has given permission for. To go beyond just a binary but into this more flexible usage policy control and uh, enable the sharing of data not through a central database but through a peer-to-peer decentralized exchange where a, de where a data provider can directly share their data uh, to a data consumer without having to go through digital green at all. Uh, but using FarmStack standards, be able to codify their usage policies in a way that protects their interests that they've negotiated with the data consumer. And have linkages uh, with other types of services, including discovery services and other third parties like FAO's AgroVac system, as well as CGIR Big Data's Guardian system uh, for folks to learn about data that they might want to tap into for the purposes of transfer. We envision sort of a larger ecosystem at a country level where uh, organizations, whether they're public, private, uh, civil society, or even individual farmers and farmer organizations can share data in a peer-to-peer -peer way codify their usage policies and have various tools, some of which may be developed by various other third parties, uh, including what we just heard about from GBADS as well as HPE for data discovery and data transformation uh, to enable a data sharing ecosystem to flourish. So with that, I'll conclude by just saying that we've generally found that data, of course, alone doesn't really cross the digital divide by any means. It's really critical that you partner all these systems with organizations and institutions on the ground to create tangible value, just as, as Lynn said. Rickon, I have a question for you based on your uh, presentation. Uh, I wanted to know more about your data transformation stage. Um, are you looking at capturing uh, semantics so that you can do this data transformation? So with respect to data transformation um, and even data discovery, uh, on those two blocks, FarmStack, we're not really focusing too much of our effort. And the reason is because we think that there's a lot of other players who are uh, working on, as you said, on semantic sort of interpretation or ontolo ontologies. And so we'd rather partner uh, with organizations that are building some of those components for different fields, just as you are for, for instance, livestock. Um, we're more focused just on one particular piece, as, as Lynn mentioned on his data plane, the data transfer component uh, in which folks are able to codify their usage policies to have this peer-to-peer -peer exchange of, of data. So Rick, and if, uh, if I'm a user or a pr prospective user of FarmStack, what, what are 
how is it rendered for, for different users and leverage? Is this a service? Is this a, a piece of software? What does one do if they want to leverage the technology you've built? Yeah, so at the moment, it's a set of APIs that we built on top of uh, this International Data Spaces Association framework, mm -hmm. basically wrapper functions uh, for folks to be able to codify their various usage policies. What we're in the process of doing is to create a more uh, easy to use uh, UI for organizations who may not be so familiar with the tools of uh, data exchange to basically customize um, and share their data in ways that are more familiar, um, like a like a Dropbox-esque kind of UI in which they're able to codify these various uh, policies. And you guys have what? How many millions of views now on YouTube? What, so what's the nature of that service? Uh, so, so the videos that we have it is produced in partnership with our various Ministry of Rural Development and Agriculture partners. Um, have reached more than 65 million uh, folks online on YouTube. Um, FarmStack is a little bit different in that it's more to enable the exchange of folks' data to potentially leverage these videos uh, with, for instance, farmer profile data that they might have collected um, and be able to target those videos in a more appropriate fashion. But those are the kind of use cases building on the content and data that we have uh, that we believe can help to spur folks' own uh, use cases of FarmStack. Are you looking at taking advantage of uh, the fact that you have these farmers, small stakeholders, that um, you have profiles and they're giving you feedback already, um, to expanding that out so that they, can, through you, they can be providing data to platforms like LINs or GBATS or that we could get that sort of, you know, if they have some IoT or if they just have a mobile phone and they want to uh, share data, that they would trust you and you could broker that kind of uh, interaction. Totally, yeah. The, the vision would be to uh, leverage the existing network of partners and farming communities that we already are plugged into for, for a two-way exchange, both to be able to leverage information, for instance, from research or other expertise uh, amongst uh, the communities that we're already working with, as well as to, for instance, crowdsource data, including, for instance, uh, animal disease types of vectors uh, that could help from a policy uh, or, or other type of point of view. Yeah, I can see a lot of potential that um, in having this trusted network that you could have something like the um, output from the models that you get from a, a project like GBADS could actually get right down to the individual farmer that you wouldn't even have to uh, necessarily have that buffer in there that it has to go through a government agency that it might actually uh, be able to, to go individual to individual. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and of course, Digital Green is just one organization. There's so many of organizations like us. Um, and the idea with FarmStack is we can use Digital Green's outreach to enable this two-way exchange to begin with to, as a proof of concept, so to speak. Uh, but the idea would be uh, for Digital Green to also say that, hey, other organizations can use this open standard for enabling their own two-way exchanges, including with GBADS um, and the rest. Perhaps with that, we can move into a, a, a conversation um, amongst us uh, about uh, what this all means um, in, in composite, these various pieces of the data sharing puzzle, so to speak, that we're each working on. But to begin with, given how COVID-19 had and the various type of secondary effects has so drastically changed our uh, respective efforts, perhaps uh, Deborah and Lynn, could you share uh, whether and how COVID-19 and its effects has accelerated or decelerated uh, your efforts and, and how it relates to, to data sharing? Um, I can start. I, I actually had a very positive experience in setting up uh, research in uh, the summer after we had uh, a lockdown uh, here in, in Canada. And the 
the techniques we learned to kept, keep our research group going, to be able to uh, talk to uh, people, to share things, uh, looking at all the various tools that are out there, because there's lots of them out there, I think it's going to inform the work that we do, because we're not able to necessarily get in contact with everybody now directly. But I think we're learning a lot about how we can transfer data, how we can interact, how we can communicate. So I actually think it's been a positive, it's, it's funny in a way, but the pandemic has been positive for trying to flesh out those uh, technologies. And I think that's actually gonna benefit us because uh, we can't personally visit every single stakeholder in our systems. So we have to have a way to outreach, a way for people to discover. And uh, those are difficult concepts, and I think we're working through them now. Yeah, with HP Enterprise. So as you're probably aware, we acquired Cray Computer you know, uh, last year. And, and of course, uh, we have donated a lot of our supercomputing services capacity to COVID research. And, and so we have many uh, customers who are using our systems today obviously to run in, you know, in incredibly in-depth analytics, looking for, for different uh, answers to questions related to COVID-19. And, and the problems we're running into, as you can imagine, are again, data sets are out there. They, there's so much work that goes into prepping and plumbing and not nearly enough work going into the actual, we'll call it the, the statistics, the machine learning itself. And, uh, and, and that has, I think, accelerated people's desire to have more standardization. Now, granted, some of that is, is along the semantic and on, you know, ontology boundaries. You know, how, how do you codify something like age in a healthcare record? I mean, it, this is crazy stuff, right? But you capitalize the A, lowercase GE, does it show up as all uppercase AGE? If you go to the, the electronic medical records that people are using to do COVID research right now, a lot of a lot of work goes into taking disparate data sets if you can find them and and conditioning them for use for analytics purposes and so the idea of publishing subscribing coming up with drivers or, or magic decoder rings for layers of metadata is probably more urgent now than ever and I think this is this is becoming evident as people you know in the past a lot of our data science work has been opportunistic uh, now people are, are more or less demanding answers to these questions, right? They, they actually need answers and they're asking for the work to get done rather than waiting for people to do work at the, its natural speed. How about you, Rick? Any on farm stack? I mean, well, you know, we, most of our work is in, in the global South in, in these small scale farming communities and much of the data there historically has been, pretty manually obtained. And that also has its commensurate issues of data quality um, and uh, frequency of updation. Uh, but as a result of uh, this COVID-19 situation, many of our government partners who are sometimes slow to adopt technology are increasingly going all in uh, with respect to using chatbots, for instance, to engage with farming communities and gather data. And this, this, this ends up gathering a lot more data, uh, but from those organizations, as well as a much wider spectrum uh, of agri-tech startups. There's, in just the last year alone, there's been 450 ag-tech startups that have received uh, $250 million worth of investment in India alone. Um, and so there's this huge ecosystem um, that makes uh, initiatives, FarmStack, as well as the work that you're doing, uh, Lynn, as well as Deborah, uh, all the more uh, possible uh, because there is this digital sort of connectivity uh, for which this is really a real need. I think it's uh, appropriate too that in all of our projects there's this notion of decentralization that you don't have a central hub controlling everything that you're trying to do it other ways and I think COVID showing that that we're getting so many people together there could be no central uh, controller with that. It's people coming together because of interest or need or some some other thing. So I think it's very interesting uh, that um, with FarmStack you have this decentralized model. With um, HPE it's a decentral, decentralized model with services that help you you know find and, and, uh, and share. So uh, I don't know what you think about it, but I think it's actually exciting that there's so much convergence on this decentralized model. 
Agreed. In fact, I have a question for you both along those exact lines. So given it's decentralized, if you're a user of InBads or FarmStack and you put data and make it available, how do you find out who did use it? So in the case of FarmStack, the various usage policies that a data provider can put in could, it can include tracking its usage uh, with respect to you know, access or perhaps there was some encryption on the data set and, and uh, being able to track how many successful versus unsuccessful attempts to decryption took place. Um, those are all possible. But I think this point about decentralization is like really interesting um, because I think we've also, you know, seen the various sort of pros and cons, right, of going too centralized. Obviously, it's like unfeasible. Nobody's going to publish all their data into some central repository. On the other hand, overly decentralized puts a lot of burden um, on the individual actors to create all these layers of data transformation and transfer and, and whatnot. Um, so, may, Deborah, do you want to speak to how you all are thinking about uh, sort of balancing sort of this centralization versus decentralization question? Yes, I mean, one of the things that was very interesting that uh, Lynn and you mentioned is, is the notion of how do you know who's got the, who's used your data, who's accessing it, those sorts of things. I think what's, um, um, from our point of view, what's very interesting is looking at, uh, we're going to do it in the cloud. So we're looking at cloud platforms, all different ones to see how do they facilitate you actually monitoring and tracking what is happening on your site. So even if, like, we want to be brokers. We don't necessarily want to have the data. We want to connect everybody uh, together and value add with things like uh, provenance or uh, licensing or things like that. But one of the things that we can add on is the notion that we can track what's going on because most of the, well, all of the cloud platforms allow you to do that. So if you set it up right, it's actually not that much of a burden uh, to track what's, what's going on. And I think that you have that level, so you have sort of the lowest level of tracking. And then I think when you come up the, the next stage where you have policies, like you're talking about, you have licensing, you have things like that, then you have the next level where uh, you're gonna be, con people are gonna be putting in contact with each other. So maybe the, uh, the broker might not even have anything to do with it. The individuals may be talking to each other. So you mentioned like the peer-to-peer, the they can track their own and peer-to-peer -peer is, is still a very powerful um, paradigm because then if you're interested in who's using your data you know because in essence they contacted you and i think that's a great way to get a convert sort of like even if it's machine to machine it's a conversation that you've started that's great um and i would encourage everyone who's on today's call to continue to ask questions in the chat box just one last question from my side. Uh, we're really hoping that today's session uh, allows us to not just be uh, a moment in time, but uh, a conversation that can continue uh, beyond today's uh, webinar uh, with those of you who are interested. And with that in mind, I'd like to ask Lynn and Deborah one final question, which is if you had one magic wand uh, around realizing this vision of creating an ag data standard for uh, data sharing, uh, what would that be? And what would you call on uh, as a call to action for those uh, uh, of those joining today's uh, conversation? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief on ours. I think that uh, the magic wand would be we have this, these uh, metadata layers well understood. And, and, uh, and it makes it possible for people to start contributing software. We expect this to be an open source activity, much like what the World Wide Web was, right? So the metadata layers for human consumption and the call to action for people would be, you know, what do you see as those layers and, and how would you like to contribute? Because uh, if you're interested, we're interested in, in having you involved. I would add on to that. That's exactly what I would be wanting is to, for people to be talking about metadata standards, about uh, how they want to talk to each other. So my magic wand would mean that we would have um, a, some virtual location where we can all go to, to share. Maybe it's something like GitHub or GitLab or whatever, but that people can go share their ideas and talk about those possibilities so that we can slowly 
uh, and so build up this uh, standard that everybody is comfortable with so that it's not imposed from the top but it's coming from the bottom. That's great. Yeah. And, Rican, your, your thoughts on that? <laughs> and yeah, Well, I would say that uh, a survey will be sent after today's call um, to ask if you want to be involved in uh, helping to define some of these technical protocols, including, for instance, the metadata standards, or uh, if you think there's a use case uh, that you might want, uh, from a programmatic point of view, want to be involved with one or more of us, uh, please uh, do let us uh, know. But this has been a, such a great conversation. I really want to thank uh, Deborah and Lynn for, for joining me in this uh, discussion, and I really want to thank CGIR, Big Data and Agriculture, for hosting. Thank you for joining.